slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director Maura Cassidy and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. This week, an ancient intruder from another galaxy exposes Star Lab to the genetic mysteries of the seeds of time on Alien Worlds. Kilometers beyond Star Lab, the SET interceptor Solaris reduces speed and moves into a preliminary docking orbit with a huge space station. Aboard the Solaris, Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff. Solaris to Star Lab control. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Solaris. We're holding at the outer boundary, Jerry. How soon can you get us aboard? Traffic's pretty heavy right now, John. I've got a Soviet freighter and two Canadian tankers coming in now. And three lunar shuttles in a docking orbit two kilometers out. Hold your position. I'll get back to you in about ten minutes. Roger, Starlab. Solaris out. Starlab, clear. Well, since ten minutes usually means half an hour, why don't we put the ship on autopilot and get onto the cargo bay for a little zero-gravity racket ball? Do you know where the rackets are? No, oh, they're floating around down there somewhere. Hmm. All right, let's go. Uh, what? We better stay, Skip. The high-density scanners are picking up something. How far away? Three, four, four point six kilometers. And it's holding at 081 degrees starboard. Get a full magnification visual and bring it up on screen six. Right. What is it? I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. In the center of the screen, against a background of jet black space and scattered stars, the mysterious object begins to slowly rotate, reflected sunlight blazing from each of its ten smooth surfaces. Solaris to Star Lab. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Solaris. Jerry, we're visually monitoring a UFO. Are you picking it up on your scanners? No, I, I don't think so. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there is something out there, about four kilometers from your present position. Right. Okay, tell Mara what the situation is, and you'd better notify Professor Ballin, too. We're going in for a closer look. I'll keep an eye on you from here, John. Be careful. Star Lab out. What do you think, buddy? Well, let's play it safe and sort of sneak up on it. I'll do a tomography profile at three kilometers. If the thing's not dangerous, we can get in close and do a phase one scanner series. And what if it explodes and blows us to kingdom come? Hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe we should stick to racquetball. <laughs> sensory overload. I wonder how she keeps her balance. Maybe it's trick photography. Ah, couldn't be. No photographer is that tricky. Captain Obert assigned to Star Lab Control. Uh, this is Star Lab. Go ahead, Maggie. We've got a problem, Jerry. We're still working on this new orbital power satellite at Vector 706, and we've just lost our last bundle of solar panels. Mm, what happened? How many panels do you need? Ten. What type? Amphitron SP-16. Oh, hold on. I'll check the computer and see what we got. <laughs> this is your lucky day, Maggie. We've got two dozen SP-16s in storage. Uh, will this be a pickup or a delivery? I won't be able to spare any of our tugs for another hour or so. What's available on your end? 
Well, uh, we've got a Soviet freighter heading your way in about 15 minutes. I'll have the captain contact you, okay? I'll stand by for his call. Thanks, Jerry. Construction over to five out. Star Lab Control, clear. Docking Bay 12, this is the bridge. Bay 12, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, Ernie, call storage bay 19 and tell them to deliver 10 Amplitron SP-16 solar panels to the Odessa. And then have Captain Vashenko contact construction orbiter 5. It's kind of an emergency. Will do, Jerry. Now, where was I? Right. Sensory overload. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Oops. Hi, Jerry. Uh, hi, Mara. You heard from John and Buddy? Yeah, about 20 minutes ago. Uh, they've maneuvered the Solaris into a side-by-side -side position with the UFO, and uh, Buddy said he'd contact us as soon as he did the preliminary scan series. Okay. What's that magazine you're holding behind you? Magazine? Come on, Jerry. Hand it over. Oh, Mara. The Astounding Adventures of Galactic Gladys, the Girl Wonder? Well, you know... Which one of these bimbos is Galactic Gladys? I believe that's her there, locked in mortal combat with the evil swamp gas creature. Well, she's certainly a wonder, all right. <laughs> I'll bet she hasn't seen her feet in years. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, where did you get this publication? I found it in the technician's lounge. Uh-huh. I wondered why they were all running around down there with their tongues hanging out. <laughs> Jerry! Uh, hi, Professor Ballin. How are you doing, Jerry? David, you're just in time for a little X-rated science fiction. Look at this. <laughs> uh, what happened to her clothes? The evil swamp gas creature ate them. Well, yum, yum. I don't know about you, David. Three days on Star Lab and you're already starting to sound like Buddy Grip. <laughs> it must be the altitude. Mm. Solaris to Star Lab Control. Uh, this is Star Lab. Go ahead, John. We finished the preliminary scans on the UFO. Is more there? I'm right here, John, and so is our new alienologist. Okay, here's Buddy. The object is three meters square and shaped like a decohedron. It's made of some kind of copper-colored metal that's about 75% hydrogen. As far as we can tell, there's no inboard or outboard propulsion system. How fast is it moving, Buddy? <laughs> How fast do you want it to move? What does he mean, John? Well, it was stationary when I brought the ship alongside. What kind of a readout did you get on the tomography scan, buddy? The interior of the thing is filled with some kind of ionized gelatin that converts to nitrogen plasma and then reconverts to gelatin at 12-second intervals. Buddy, is it giving off any kind of sound? Yes, it is. When the gelatin converts to plasma, the object gives off what sounds like accelerated heartbeats. And when the plasma reconverts to gelatin, we hear the heartbeats in reverse. Returning from a routine patrol aboard the Solaris, SET captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff encounter an unidentified flying object 50 kilometers beyond Star Lab. The object is three meters square and shaped like a decohedron. It's made of some kind of copper-colored metal that's about 75% hydrogen. As John maneuvers the Solaris into a side-by-side -side position with the UFO, Buddy continues to analyze the object with the ship's tomography scanners. The interior of the thing is filled with some kind of ionized gelatin that converts to nitrogen plasma and then reconverts to gelatin at 12-second intervals. What do you think, David? I think we'd better see about getting that thing into one of the isolated laboratory pods. Buddy, shoot a magnetic grappler over and see if you can bring it in. We already tried that, Mora. The grappler pad won't stick. The object is anti-magnetic. How about if you go EVA and try to push it into the Solaris's cargo bay? Hold on just a moment, please. I don't think that'll be necessary. From the way it's been matching our speed, I think it'll follow us in. All right, give it a try. If it works, get the object as close as you can to the outboard airlock of Isolab 9. I'll have a crew standing by to take it inside. Okay, Mora. Solaris out. Star Lab clear. Come on, David. Let's get down there. Fifteen minutes later, 
the Solaris maneuvers the object into a position two meters away from Isolab 9's outboard airlock. Then, as John guides the Solaris into a nearby docking bay, the lab's airlock opens, and a crew of technicians in yellow pressure suits and tinted glass helmets take the alien decahedron inside. Ten minutes later, the object rests on a slowly rotating observation pad in the center of the lab's brightly lit quarantine chamber. It's remarkably beautiful, isn't it? Frightens me. Why? The way it looks. The color and size, texture. All those desperately perfect angles constantly repeating themselves. Its physical aspects are so familiar, we can call them by name in a language we all understand. And yet we don't know what it calls itself or what it might be calling us. You feel whatever is inside is alive? Don't you? Yes. At least our scientific cells are still in sync. Maura, please. Not now. Mm. Hey, hey, look who's here. Gang. Hi, fellas. Well, I'm glad to see it hasn't blown up yet. Come on, Skip. Let's go inside for a close-up. Yeah, okay. I think you better stay on this side of the glass for a while. The object's still being scanned. If you go in there now, your body impulses will be included in the scanner data. Hmm. Uh, maybe we should go in anyway, just to blow their minds up in data processing. <laughs> I can hear <laughs> Professor Clark now. I say, Ramsey, have you seen this printout? Green and Griff are trapped inside that alien gizmo. Really? How do you know it's them? Elementary, my dear Ramsey. The tall one's thumbing his nose. And the short one thinks it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Maura, David, not even a smile. What's with you two? We've got a lot on our minds, John. I, yeah, I see. Well, uh, oh, okay. Uh, come on, Skip. Let's go have dinner. Yeah, right. So we'll see you guys. Uh, see you later. It's time we had a talk, David. Let's go up to my quarters. wasn't my idea, Maura. We go where the ISA wants us to go. You know that. If I'd known you were married, I would have asked Commissioner White to send someone else. Why? When I was told you were going to spend three months on Starlab, I thought we were getting a second chance. Second chance for what, Maura? To pick it up where it fell apart three years ago? Why not? Because your work has always been more important to you than anything else. And I don't think that'll ever change. Even when things were good, we... We were never together more than three months out of the year. Your whole life was spaceports and laboratories and conferences and trips off the planet. You make it sound like I didn't care at all. I don't mean to, Maura. I know you cared. And I know you loved me. But you loved the rockets more. I'm sorry, David. So am I. I'll, uh... I'll see you in the morning, Maura. Okay, Lunar Shuttle 10, I have you on the screen. Uh, you're docking orbit insertion coordinates are 509er at subvector 70 alpha. Lab control clear. Uh, morning, Mara. Jerry, have you seen David? Not since yesterday afternoon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Have either of you seen David? Yeah, uh, we saw him after dinner last night when we went down to have another look at the UFO. He was in the isolab with it. Maybe he's still there. I checked the isolab 20 minutes ago. Well, maybe you missed him. Let's go down and take another look. Hit the intercom button, Skip. David, can you come out for a minute? There's no need to be frightened, Mara. Professor Ballon has not been harmed. David, what's the matter with you? You sound so... Mara, his hands are transparent. David, what happened to your hands? 
is not David. I am not Professor Balanmora. I am of him. David is safe inside my vehicle. Well, then open it. Let him out. As you wish, Mora. David! Good God. Isolab control to sick bay. Sick bay? Dr. Rossiter? Diana, this is Buddy. John, Get down to Isolab 9 as no, fast no, as you wait. can. Mora and bring a portable no vital sign indicator. The David no, Fallon's no, inside the UFO and he's encased in case and some kind of gelatin. There is no need to be frightened. Professor Ballon has not been harmed. Entering the control booth of Isolab 9, Mora, Buddy, and John discover that the substance inside the alien decahedron has transformed itself into a duplicate of Professor David Ballon, leaving the real David Ballon encased in a cocoon of translucent white gelatin. You tried to get into the chamber. The hatch is sealed from the inside. There's no need to be frightened, Dr. Rossiter. Professor Ballon has not been harmed. He knows me. He knows all of us, Diana. Connect the vital sign indicator to the scanner terminal, John. Oh, he's all right. His vital signs are perfect. Oh, boy. Well... Soon? How long is soon? No. David, are you all right? Uh, I think so, yes. I suggest you leave the chamber now, David. The placenta residue will soon convert to a toxic gas that could mutate your senses. That thing opened up last night and took me inside. I thought I was a goner. But as soon as the seat placenta started to cover me, I, I wasn't afraid anymore. It was incredible. I, I sensed everything that was going on. And when my duplicate emerged, it, it was like one of those films where the guy dies and you see a spirit leave his body. Film, huh? <laughs> I guess art imitates life after all. Uh, I, I think it's the other way around, Skip. Oh, yes, they should be. But they rarely are. Perhaps we should learn the lesson of the Balinese. They say they have no art. They simply do everything as well as they can. You once said that to me, David. I know. It's amazing, isn't it, how precisely I've been duplicated. Well, David number two, what now? Now, hold on a minute, you. I'm not in the habit of running off to alien worlds with life forms I hardly know. You know me, Mora. And I know you. <laughs> He's got a point there, Mora. Well, be that as it may, I just don't think the original me and the duplicate you are ready for... You, I'm... Well, why are your hands transparent anyway? David was wearing protective gloves that prevented the seed placenta from taking a precise imprint hands. And Mora, a duplicate of you is all I want. Why? I still love you, Mora. Oh, David. Why didn't you... Wait a minute. What am I saying? <laughs> oh, this is weird. David? Yes? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, David. I mean the duplicate, David. Yes, David. I think all of us would like to know a little more about your origins. Centuries ago, explorers from another galaxy visited my planet. Their bodies contained bacteria, harmless to them, but lethal to us. There was a plague, and before the end came, our scientists created the placenta substance and filled it with the genetic seeds that were the essence of our race. Then they placed these seeds of time in hundreds of vehicles like this one and set us adrift in the universe. 
Was your race humanoid? Yes, buddy, it was. But some of the cells were randomly coated, so we could become whatever organic life form we contacted. I could have been a bird or an insect, or even a flower. Any living thing in which the seeds could take root. What would have happened if you had become a flower? I would have simply pollinated other flowers of the same species, and my race would have been reborn as a genus of conscious, intelligent orchids or roses. Would you eventually have re-evolved your original humanoid form? Eventually, yes. But I'm not a flower, am I? I'm an ion-negative duplicate of a human male, and my race can be reborn only if I interact with an ion-positive duplicate of a human female. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> Good, my girl. Mara. Thank you, Mora. It's okay. Just remember, I don't fool around on the first date. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Saturate yourself with pure oxygen for two minutes. That will protect you from the toxic residue. Then come into the chamber and enter the secondary placenta compartment of my vehicle. Okay. Get me an E4 oxygen unit, buddy. I'm about to become a double feature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mara. I'll be all right, Diana. I'll be all right, Diana. Listen to that. I'm in stereo. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. I have a question. Yes? Uh, when you and David, uh, this David, are, you know, when you're... Uh, will I feel anything? We don't know, Mara. It's possible. Hmm. You'd better leave the chamber now, Mora. The placenta residue is starting to become toxic. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mora. Did you arrange for a ship, John? There's a long-range shuttle waiting for them just outside the airlock. Mara, you'll be able to fly the shuttle, won't you? Love the rockets as much as you do now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, so long, you two. Good morning. Good luck. It looks like we're getting that second chance after all, Mara. You're right, David. You're absolutely right. Seeds of Time was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Pete Renaday and Francis Bay. Associate producer Ron Thompson, music director Tom Rounds, engineer Stu Jacobs, technical consultant Peter Skye, assistant to the producer Jim Cook. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, The Madonnas of Zanzibar Alpha, from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. <laughs> <laughs>